The gospel lesson is from the gospel according to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what's written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to be clear that my decision to do a sermon series on monsters this fall was not a call to the universe to send more monstrous events to the world. You can stop, okay? I have enough material. And yet, here we are. But one of the things about monsters that I highlighted in the first week of this series is that monsters are not unique to certain times and places. The things that give rise to the creation of monsters are deep-seated human instincts and impulses, and therefore continue to crop up wherever and whenever people are found. Monster stories themselves are always some version of a monster lurking for a time in some hidden place on the edge of civilization. They live at the bottom of lakes or oceans or in the swamps, deep in caves, in the darkest forests, or at the edge of the world, in the far reaches of space. And then something happens that brings them out of hiding, filled with rage, and our stories show them expressing that rage in gruesome, destructive ways, coming out of hiding and becoming a threat to human society. While it's almost always the brave hero who goes out to save the world when the monster strikes, during the more peaceful times, it's the figure of the wise elder, the crone, the shaman, the oracle, the prophet, who keeps the monster stories alive. That's not keeping them alive to keep people scared, but to keep people vigilant. Prophets remind us that monsters are never truly conquered because their origins are right within us, within the human psyche. The prophet also has a keen eye for another character in most monster lore, the trickster. Coyote serves that role in Native American stories. It's Loki, the god of chaos in Norse legends. In Chinese culture, it's the monkey king. In Greek mythology, it's Hermes, who invented lying. He was the messenger for the gods, so maybe you had to do that if you were delivering messages to the gods, but he was... Hermes invented lying in Greek mythology. More modern examples are the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland or the Wizard in The Wizard of Oz. The trickster figure is always a master of disguise, keeping their own counsel and serving their own desires. The trickster sometimes lies outright, 
but more frequently tells only half truths. In both cases, the intent is to deceive for a self-serving interest. You personally might be helped by their deception or you might be hunted to extinction, but in both cases, it is about them and not about you. If it serves their ends to help you, you benefit, but the next week their ends might change and the opposite could be the case and you could be under the bus. To make things even more complicated, sometimes the trickster lies about the existence of a monster itself. Having a monster in your back pocket that you can pull out whenever you want can be handy if you need to scare people into doing what you want. In the Bible, this happens at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. The Hebrews have lived in Egypt in peace for centuries at this point, with Abraham's great-grandson Joseph having played an indispensable role in the Egyptian court even saving Egypt from famine back in the day. But as Exodus begins, we hear the ominous words in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. You might imagine creepy music behind this. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. All this new king could see was that an immigrant population was about to outnumber native Egyptians. And Pharaoh believed that was a threat to his power. His own security, insecurity, then rose up to create a monster. It also created not only the monster, but the remedy for the monster, which he explained to his people in a half-truth. Pharaoh points out that native Egyptians are now in the minority. Fact check, true. But then he tacks on a lie that he just pulls out of thin air. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Without oppression, will the Hebrews continue to increase? Yes. Will they leave Egypt? Who knows? Maybe, if it suits them. But they've lived in Egypt hundreds of years now. And if you don't want them there, why would you care if they left? Lots of red flags in what Pharaoh has to say here. But the big and destructive lie is saying that just because they have a different ancestry, the Hebrews would automatically be turncoats and fight with the enemy should war come to Egypt. There is zero evidence of that charge. But fear shuts down our ability to think with any kind of nuance. Pharaoh's lie works, and the oppression of the Israelites in Egypt begins. Pharaoh set up four monstrous centuries of slavery by deceiving the Egyptian people. Their Israelite neighbors were innocent of Pharaoh's charges. But once the violence started... Once a people came to view themselves as superior and others as somehow worthy of abuse, every year, every decade, every century that it went on made the monstrous cycle harder to even see, let alone to break. Worse, enslaving peaceful citizens because of an ancestral difference set up the likelihood that both populations would internalize the false idea that there is somehow a hierarchy of persons, that some people are biologically superior or inferior to others. Once the Israelites are freed by Moses, the laws given to the Israelites during their 40-year sojourn in the desert attack that false notion of some being superior and some being inferior head on. Not only in the Ten Commandments, but in many of the other laws we find in the books of Exodus and Leviticus, the Israelites are told in no uncertain terms that they need to remember the injustice they were subjected to in Egypt and not let it happen to others on their watch. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 33 says, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. 
You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Crystal clear. That verse is a bookend for another verse, 15 verses earlier in Leviticus 19.18, which says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Those two verses from Leviticus are what Jesus pulls together in Luke 10, when a religious scholar asks Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus has the man answer his own question, which the man does readily by reciting the command to love God with all his heart, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. Jesus gives him an A on that quiz. Yep, you got it. That's it. Do that and you will live. But the man won't move on without more information. But who is my neighbor? He wants to know. I think he likely wanted a loophole in the law. Bible says he wanted to justify himself. But in the man's defense, Leviticus 19.18 does at least appear to limit the word neighbor to your own people. There's a chance the man honestly wanted to clear that up. Jesus still wants him to answer his own question, though. That's a thing with Jesus, and Jesus typically wants us to be able to answer our own questions, too. But Jesus puts the message of Leviticus 19.33, which is quite clear to include the foreigner in the definition of neighbor, he puts all that into a story, which we have come to call the story of the Good Samaritan. Today, the story is so embedded in our culture with the names of hospitals and nonprofits that we often miss its punch. We correctly equate Good Samaritan with acts of kindness, but what we often miss is how offensive it was for Jesus, a Jewish man, to use this story to explain Jewish law to another Jewish scholar. When Jesus, when Jesus picked a Samaritan to be the hero and picked several Jewish leaders to be callous and self-absorbed, Jesus was lifting up as a hero, a despised population. The phrase good Samaritan would have been an oxymoron to every Jew within earshot. The animosity between Jews and Samaritans was already centuries old by the time of Jesus and created a chasm of disgust and hatred that divided their respective peoples physically, religiously, socially, and emotionally. Sometimes when I've used this story, I've rewritten it to change the parties from Jews and Samaritans to whatever population is currently despised by my audience at the time to better illustrate the punch. But right at this moment, all we need to know about this story is that Samaria is today the West Bank. It's Palestinian territory. The story takes place on the road that runs south from Jerusalem to Jericho, a road that begins in today's Israeli territory and ends in Palestinian territory. In today's geography and politics, it's the story of the good Palestinian. When I went to the prayer service at Temple Shir Tikva right after the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas, they were able to hold the reality of good Palestinians in their hearts and prayers. I heard it. And we shared those prayers together. But not many can hold that line or hold it for long especially when there are those dedicated to making it as hard as possible to see those different from us as being also precious in God's sight. A landlord outside of Chicago was made so fearful of Palestinians by the tricksters he listened to on talk radio that he went to the door of one of his tenants and brutally stabbed a Palestinian mother 26 times before stabbing and killing her precious six-year-old boy. That man would have been so offended by Jesus' story of the good Palestinian that he would have joined the crucify him crowd during Holy Week. And he is sadly not alone. 
in Luke 10, Jesus told that story to that man to shake him up, to make him realize that gaining eternal life was not a matter of being part of some superior ethnicity or religion. It was about the ability to love your enemies. Love not as a warm, fuzzy feeling, but love as the concrete action of giving aid to anyone who is suffering. That's the entire gospel in just 12 verses of Luke 10. The man's initial question was not, who is my neighbor? That was the follow-up question. The question that started it all was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer, loving God by extending care and mercy equally to all. If we did but that, everything else falls into place. Peace, justice, mercy, humility, life. Obviously, we have not found that to be easy. There could, in fact, have been a different story about the man who was mugged and left for dead in the road. We were given just the examples of two who passed by with indifference and then the one who stopped for help, to help. But those aren't the only options. In another setting, there might have been another person who passed by. Jesus might have told a story about someone who came on the scene, saw the man in the ditch, noticed he was still alive, noticed he was of a different race or ethnicity or religion, and kicked him in the head until he died. We might then have seen the dead man's relatives stop looking for the robbers and instead hunt down the one who killed him in cold blood. When they caught him, they might have been enraged enough to not only kill him, but torture him first. And that would have set off the attacker's family, because after all, the man in the ditch was part of a group that had burned their homes and sacked their city. That's what they'd heard. He was not innocent. Soon there is war, more torture, more killing, more trauma, until the monster comes to destroy all in its path. Welcome to 2023. It's easy to sit in comfort and say, oh, we would be different. We would stop. Don't be so sure. In August of 1990, I was still married and living just outside of Gainesville, Florida, where my husband was a professor at the university and where I worked at the bookstore across the street. Across that month for four long weeks, Four students at the University of Florida and one at nearby Santa Fe Community College were brutally murdered by a serial killer named Danny Rowling. It was a terrifying time. The young children of a friend from church stopped eating their breakfast. And when their mom pressed them, why aren't you eating your breakfast? This is like the third day in a row. Well, mom, there's a serial killer. Thought it was Captain Crunch coming for him or something. And we laughed even then, but it really, it was no joke. They were young and they were scared and they couldn't understand and it affected their ability to eat. We all moved in groups across those weeks. We had secret knocks to identify ourselves when we were visiting with friends. Then our church organist, Dorothy, and her husband, Pete, who I refer to as my Florida parents, got the call. Their niece, Krista Hoyt, was a victim. She was the student at Santa Fe. Worse, the brutality of her murder was so sadistic and twisted that it was her story that dominated the news. It was Krista's body bag that her parents and Pete and Dorothy had to see in news clips coming out of her apartment again and again and again on every channel. You can look her up to find the details. I won't traumatize you with them here, except to say that after beheading her, he put her severed head on a bookcase and moved the bookcase to face the door, 
setting the gruesome scene to inflict as much terror as possible to whomever next opened that door. Danny Rowling was captured and executed by the state of Florida in 2006. I sat with Pete and Dorothy through it all. I sat with my own opposition to the death penalty on one shoulder, which is the formal position of the United Methodist Church, by the way, and my relief that he was no longer on this earth on the other. And I had never met Krista. I had only known the terror of being daily at the university where a serial killer was targeting young women. Pete and Dorothy, as her aunt and uncle, had much deeper trauma, grief, and rage to process. Thoughts too dark to name as they walked with Krista's mother, who wrestled with whether or not to see her daughter's body, or later to go to the trial and be exposed to the pictures that were found on the scene. Trust me when I say that you do not know what you would do until you find yourself in a similar situation and feel the trauma seep into your cells. Were Pete not a quadriplegic, I am 1000% sure he would have picked up a rifle the very night of Krista's murder and headed for Gainesville. And had he done that, it would not have helped. It would not have helped him. It would not have helped the family. It could not have brought Krista back and it would not have helped the world understand that returning violence for violence does not and cannot lead to peace. And yet, all who knew Pete would have understood if he had found Danny Rowling wounded in a ditch and kicked him dead. I don't know how you stop the cycle of terror and vengeance once it's begun let alone once it's been perpetuated for literally thousands of years, as is, as is the case in the Middle East. People are broken by trauma in myriad ways, and we're now learning that our trauma can be passed from generation to generation through our genes. We don't know what others carry. We don't know what we ourselves carry. Intellectually knowing that violence begets more violence does not make us immune from the rage and fear when it happens to us and our loved ones. And those feelings open us to manipulation by whatever trickster decides to direct our rage against innocence for their own ends. We can unwittingly become the very monster we decry, all while believing ourselves to be the heroes. What the right policy is for warring governments once the atrocities are in full swing, I have no clue. But I am crystal clear about what Jesus' policy is when we find even a sworn enemy lying wounded in a ditch. We are to stop and render medical, logistical, and financial assistance and then come back later to make sure they're doing okay and help more if needed. Not a single soul is more or less deserving than another. That is by no means easy, none of it. And we believe it would be easy at our peril. But although it's not easy, it is clear. Don't expect that to be a popular position. But that's what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus lived. And the central symbol of our faith reminds us that Jesus absorbed the world's violence into himself and then took it all into the grave so that we might have a chance to start again. So maybe Christians not yet in the monster's grasp could start there. We can love Jesus. Since Jesus loves us, we can draw the circle a bit wider to include ourselves. And if we really love ourselves, we'll have less baggage to project out onto others and can draw the circle wider still. We can be kind. Our circle might bump up against trouble here and there. 
it could take some time, years even, to get over a particular bias, to expose the lie of a trickster who keeps whispering, oh, but not them, to expand our circle further. It might begin to look less like a circle and more like a Salvador Dali painting. We might have to retell the Good Samaritan story with some different characters to ourselves in order to refocus. But it remains the call of Christ. Do you want eternal life? Do you want to keep the monsters quiet and content? Do you want God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? Then keep expanding the circle. Love your neighbor. Love the alien in your land. Be kind. Amen.